And that was the process that we went through. And it freed people to discover that if they didn't get a message from a preaching on a Sunday, that God could still speak to them because we had taught them to hear the voice of God themselves. We had removed the necessity for them to hear a preacher telling them what God was saying because we taught them you can all engage God. You can all go into heaven. You can all experience God, that God loves you. Now, that freed them and freed them. You know, there are some people who like fellowship and like friendship and they like to engage with people and they find that good. That's great. So long as they don't think that that is the only way there is or they start to judge other people for not doing it that way. And that's the key. Let people find with God where they are and there, therefore they can enjoy the process and the, and the journey they're on. I have been uh, thinking and realizing that when I want to tell the gospel to someone, um, nowadays I have to think. It's not like I would want to tell the same as I always have. Mm. Uh, you know, it has changed. <laughs> mm. Things in my mind has changed. Yeah. And uh, now before, I wrote down what I would say, and that was very good because I'm not very good in writing down things. But I want to ask you, if you meet someone who really doesn't know much about mm. the gospel, about Jesus, um, how would you tell the gospel? I mean, maybe you wouldn't tell everything. I don't know what you would do. But yeah, what would you do? What would you say? Okay, well, if I was engaged, if I met someone for the first time or there was a relationship and it, and the opportunity opened up um, for that, I would be looking to uh, only do what the father's doing. So it's always engaging with the father to see what is the father's heart in this situation right now. And as Jesus only did what he saw the father doing, therefore, there were times when he did things one way and there were times he did things another. Times he taught, times he healed, times he did various things. So I would always be looking, what is the father's heart in this situation? And how can I outwork the father's heart in cooperation with him? So if that is you felt... Yeah, I really want to tell them how much God loves them, that type of dynamic. Then I would be looking to engage around love. So try to help them see that any of the preconceptions they might have had about God and any of the preconceptions they might have had about Christians are, are not true. So I would always go from a point of inclusion God has already done everything necessary for you to have a relationship with him. You just haven't realized it rather than sort of the four spiritual laws or, you know, the sort of, well, you're separated from God and you have to, you have to do this to come back to God. I always would start with God has done everything necessary for you to have a relationship with him. You just haven't realized that. And then see what their response is. And then from their response, see where you go. If they're like, oh, well, I thought I had to do this or I thought I, had, you know, they probably have some ideas that are probably wrong ideas based because that's what their perception is through Christianity or, or anything else. So depending on what their response is, then you can then tackle that response. So, you know, if they have a preconceived idea about god um it's like well i i thought that i had to repent well then you could go back and say well actually repentance isn't what you think it is repentance is just agreeing with god about you he loves you so it's agreeing that god loves you and you receive his love rather than oh yeah i must be so sorry for all the things i've done in my life and blah, blah, blah. it's always focused on the negative it's not good news Whereas Jesus wants people to enter into a relationship with the father through him. And that's what you can help people to do. So you can explain, look, God has made a way for you to go to him in relationship and for you to know that you're forgiven, reconciled, restored. Everything in your life has been brought back from where you've been. You don't know who you are as a son of God, but now you can know who you are as a son of God. 
So know that you are in relationship with a father and you don't have to go into too much about Jesus unless they bring that up. Because Jesus has already done the cross. It's already happened. You don't have to necessarily explain it. Uh-huh. Well, Jesus died on the cross for you. Well, that's OK. If they're interested to know, well, how can I have a relationship with the father? You can say, well, Jesus took on my lost identity. Uh, the whole of humanity is lost identity. And in taking on our lost identity, he enabled us to be found again and discover who we truly are. And that is children of God. And therefore, children have a relationship with their father. So you can base it everything around the positive. You know, and then if they've got questions, then you can answer their questions from that perspective rather than trying to tell them too much information, which they may not need. You know, Mm -hmm. respond to them rather than giving them a patter or a sales Mm -hmm. pitch. Respond Mm -hmm. to where they are and they Mm -hmm. may have an issue in their life. Mm -hmm. If therefore you can say, well, God's interested in you. He loves you. He wants the best for you. He can help you with that situation. They may have a sickness or an illness. Therefore, you can talk about, well, God came. And Jesus came as God and heal people to show that God wants to heal. So you can talk about the issues that they have. Rather than selling them something. Or giving them a particular pitch which they may not even need. Therefore, every individual is a person that God has an answer to the situations in their life and would want to meet them in that situation. So from that perspective, you can always remain positive, you know, rather than focusing on the negatives, you know, never folk go in on, oh, well, you're a sinner and you need to be saved and all that stuff. You know, I wouldn't even use the word salvation as such. I would always talk about relationship. God wants to restore a relationship with you so you can know him as your dad and you can know that all the benefits of knowing him, which is to receive a completely different understanding of who you are, of who he is, to find a purpose in life. All of that stuff can all come out of the discussion. Um, and you don't need to go into things unless they bring it up. You know, mm. and I and I think when I look back and look at the times that I talk to people, I tried to give them everything in one hit. So, you know, yeah. too much. They couldn't digest it. And they, there was information that they didn't even need. Mm. You know, and that, so I would suggest uh, from that perspective, just going along the conversation and allowing them to open the conversation up rather than you trying to say, well, I've got to tell them this, I've got to tell them that. Mm. You know, if you stick with the positive sense, God already loves you. And they might be mm. surprised at that because they might have thought, well, how can God love me? I thought, you know, I had to be good enough. And you say, well, mm. Jesus is good enough. You know, Jesus made you good enough because he made you right in with god you know so you can use words and i would avoid you know theological words unless they bring them up so i wouldn't necessarily use salvation redemption you know the words justification all those sort of words that a theologian might use when talking about well what did jesus do i would simplify it in language that they understand so rather than saying hey you're the rightness of god in christ well then what's righteousness just say God has made you right. Jesus has made you right with God. So he's dealt with everything that was a problem. That would get in the way of your relationship already. And he's included you. In what he's done. Without you having to do anything. So now would you like to experience God's love and know him? If they say yes. Then I would do an encounter with them rather than. Well, pray this prayer. You know, so would you like to meet God? Okay, well, close your eyes. Do whatever you feel can help them experience God. And then when they've had an experience of God and his love, and you can, of course, you can pray for them. You can pray, hey, I pray that you experience God's love and you experience God's grace and mercy and all those things. You can pray, but they need to experience it. 
So I would always allow time for an activation in which, so, okay, let's do this right now. Close your eyes, picture a door, open a door. God is willing to meet you on the other side of that door. It's just your choice to open it. He's willing to engage you. And I would probably, if they're interested more, I would talk about God is already at work in you. God dwells within you in a part of you that you've not connected to. So then you're not saying, oh, well, there's this outside in approach. God is outside. You're separated from him. I would say, no, you've already been connected to him. You just haven't realized it yet. So Jesus dwells in you. His life is in you. He wants you to know the abundance of that life. So you can pitch it very differently in this is already done. You just haven't experienced it yet. Yeah. Yeah. Rather than the negative, you've got to do this and you've got to do that and you've got to do that, you know. Yeah. And then you're always staying on the positive. That's so good. Yeah. I don't think it's very easy because it requires a, a dialogue. Yeah. You know, between with the person and you really um feel God's love for them. Yeah. And you really are interested in them and their situation. Mm. And yeah. you are sensitive kind of to their needs. I mean God gives that, doesn't it? Doesn't he? So but <laughs> it requires that really. It does, it? yes. It what it because God loves them and is interested in them. And if we're not showing any interest in them, yeah. how will yeah. they think God will be interested in them if we don't show yeah. that interest? It's asking them about the situation of their life rather than mm -hmm. I'm going to force this one message down your yeah. throat, whether you like it or not, and you've yeah. got to receive this <laughs> message. Actually, it's about God personally meeting them where they are in yeah. the situation that he's interested, he cares, he wants to help them and he wants to help them discover who they really are in life yeah. so that they can realize that he already loves them. You know, that is a different approach. And I think it's the approach that treats everyone individually and doesn't treat people yeah. like a commodity. Yeah. You know, it's like when people did um, different forms of evangelism and there were courses on how you do evangelism, it was mm. all about how you get the message to them. Mm. How do you get them to listen to this message rather than how can we relate to them and help them relate to God in the reality of their lives that we're interested in them, not in their conversion. Mm. You know, and that that is the way I think a lot of evangelism, unfortunately, was done. Mm. We were taught, how can you get the message into this conversation? Mm, exactly. Rather than how can you develop a relationship with this person that can open the door for them to meet with God? They they need to meet God in us. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. They, they, they need to see Jesus and to, to feel and to yeah. experience God in us. Maybe not being aware of it <sighs> and maybe not we being aware of it, but that's what they need, isn't it? Well, yes, it is. Um, so there's something about we have the light within us. We have the presence of God within us. We are effectively Jesus with skin on mm. <laughs> to those people. Mm. You know, they've never met him. So they mm. need to meet him in us. Jesus came as the express image of the father. Mm. To show the people around him. <clears throat> this is what the father was like. Because mm. they've never met him before. And their view of him was nothing like what Jesus came to represent. So I think if we do the same and our representatives, ambassadors of reconciliation, it calls us, to help them see that God has already done everything necessary to bring that relationship about. And then we can experience, help them experience that relationship. Hmm. Thank you. That's so good. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> okay anybody else yeah at the back of that i was just going thinking that i think it's difficult because we still have to deconstruct our minds from the old ways and um do you do you have a suggestion really of how to to quickly do that 
because I think, like she's saying, sometimes I find myself find it difficult to do that um, because um, because you you are in a discussion and you can tell where the discussion is going for you to then bring that in. Um, people are already in a different mindset and and you are trying to bring in the new mm. and they think that it's um you've gone mad for lack of a better word to think that way well i i don't think most people will have a problem when you show care and concern and compassion for them and you show them that god loves them and cares for them i don't think that's a real problem the issue they have that that might not align to what they have been told by other people or what they think about through religion so you can be a brush of fresh air by not focusing on their sin and separation from god and all the things they've got to do to get back to god if you focus on the positive then they'll be positive you know if i a lot of people react against the negative well if we're not negative there's nothing to react against so if we're genuine about wanting the best for them then we can take our time there's a difference between meeting someone on a train that you'll never meet again than if you've got a relationship with someone that you'll see once or twice a week or once every few weeks because you can take the time to develop the relationship that will show them that you're interested and care for them and that god does if i was to meet someone i wasn't going to meet them again again i would just want to leave a good impression that god is good and that i'm interested in their lives and god is and i would be sensitive to them not trying to give them everything because i might not have time to do that and therefore i might come over as i'm trying to get you to hear this message rather than i would ask more questions of them than they would probably of me and that shows the interest which opens up the door and if the conversation is such that they're talking about god or some sort of thing and it, particularly that comes from they may ask you something and what you say i mean if they ask me a question and i talk to them about being a mentor of people online and all that stuff in in spirituality and stuff then that opens a door obviously for them to be oh oh what's that about you know but if you don't, then that might not be the first thing that they ask you. But that's OK, because you're not responsible for everything in their lives. And if you're only meeting them once for an hour, then it's very different from an ongoing relationship. So you might just sow a seed. Yeah, you'd, you'd, sow a, you'd sow a seed of saying God is good. And then they say, God loves you. Yeah. And then they say. Oh, if God is good, why are, oh, why is all these bad things happening? Where is he? Okay. Well, then you answer that question in the, who's doing the bad things? People. Why are they doing the bad things? Because they don't know that they're children of God and would operate as God being good to each other. So you can always bring it back to the fact that people are the way they are because they don't know who they are and they're operating out of their lost identity and therefore they're damaged and they're not operating in the fact that they've been made in the image of god so they're not operating like god to people who loves them which is why they're doing bad things but separate who god is from the people who don't know that they're supposed to be like god and you can then say actually the people who do these things are doing them because they don't know God and they're not inspired by God to be like God. So they're not operating like God does in love in everybody. So well, why doesn't God change it? So that you can then sort of talk about how the fact is, well, God's giving us the the in, the sort of responsibility for our own lives. And he's given us the opportunity to actually make our own choices. And if you want God to stop someone doing something bad. Then you'd have to stop everyone doing something bad and everyone then would have no choice and they'd all be robots. 
unable to make a choice, programmed. Well, God wants relationship with people by choice, not because they're forced to have a relationship with him. Or they're controlled in that relationship. God does not control us. He's given us the choice and we chose to do things which were not like him, independent of him. So you can get uh, over in a conversation. See, people always think God's an easy target. I'll blame God for the bad things in the world. No, God made people good. They chose to do bad things. Because they lost their perspective on who they really are. So you can always bring a positive thing around. Um, and when it comes to sort of deconstruction, we can't deconstruct our own minds because you're using the same knowledge that you already have to try and change your thinking to something else. So we don't need to deconstruct our minds. We just need to keep following Jesus, following the Father and let him deconstruct our minds by the experiences we have of him. How do I know God is good? Because he's good to me. How do I know God is love? Because he loves me. It's not a theory. It's the reality of my relationship with him that he unconditionally loves me. And I would talk about unconditional love to people. You know, if someone said to me, well, God loves me unconditionally. Well, there are no conditions. I can, I can do what I like and he still loves me. Yeah, you can, but you won't enjoy that love and you won't enjoy life because there'll be consequences of you doing all the things you want in this life broken relationships damage all that stuff so you don't have to again focus on the negative you focus on the positive so yeah god loves you unconditionally you know i was talking to a guy recently and he was talking to someone he's a he's a, a guy who is a was an ex-pastor and various things and he so this guy asked me and said um well if i become a christian would i have to stop sleeping around and I knew exactly what he was going to tell the guy. <laughs> and of course, he did. Yes, absolutely. You've got to stop sleeping around. Otherwise, you can't be a Christian. And I'm like, why on earth did you say that to him? You're going to put him off. It's like all you had to do is say, no, there's no conditions on you being a Christian. For knowing that God loves you. And when you discover God loves you, you probably won't want to sleep around anymore. Because God will probably give you one person who will be the person for you. But God will deal with that. See, we're always focused on behavior. Your behavior isn't acceptable to God. So your behavior has to change. Whereas if we get over that they're acceptable to God because they're his children. Then God will deal with the behavior because they're obviously if they're sleeping around, they're operating out of the fact that they don't know love and they're looking for love and they're they're insecure and they need constant relationships to make them feel better well when they've met god and god starts to show them how much they're loved and accepted they won't need to sleep around but god will deal with that so he put them off knowing god loves them unconditionally so they went away thinking oh well i'll, I'll never be a christian then because i'm not good enough. i'm not good enough for god which is a completely wrong message and he was proud of the fact that he didn't compromise on the gospel. <laughs> and, I'm, and I'm like, you just got absolutely no clue about what the gospel is. <laughs> you know, but I knew what it was going to be because he's basically conditioned into thinking it's about behavior change. And we're not acceptable to God unless our behavior changes. No, God loves us as we are. And of course, he'll want us to become more as he intends us to be, which will, of course, deal with those behavioral issues because most people's behavioral issues are only because they don't know who they are. Thank De you. Yeah, but deconstruction of our way of thinking towards it comes from our experiencing God that way. If I give people theory about God, then they're going to see the holes in that theory in my own life. If I tell people the testimony of my experience of God based on the fact that I know God loves me unconditionally, that there are no conditions attached, that I'm been reconciled and included in Christ and all those amazing things. Then I will be able to share that good news with other people because I've experienced it. If I'm giving them theory, 
then they'll know that it isn't real in me. So the best way of deconstruction is to experience the truth, which will challenge the things in our lives which are not the truth. Rather than trying to change lies, experience the truth. Focusing on the negative of changing the things that are negative in our lives will only cause us to actually focus on the, the problem and the problem will get bigger the more we focus on it and the harder it will get. If we focus on the solution, the solution will deal with the problem. So no one can deconstruct their own mind. Only God can do it. If we continue to walk with him, he will do things in our lives which will totally challenge everything we thought about ourselves, him and everything else. But the way the people will teach you to deconstruct your mind, or they probably won't use that word, they would probably say renew your mind. See, deconstruction is removing negative things. Whereas I don't believe God is real. Deconstruction is what happens as a result of God showing us the true nature of him rather than god trying to say i'm not like this i'm not like this he's going to be trying to show us what he's really like so the renewing of our minds causes the deconstruction because it challenges the things that i thought were true and now i realize they're not true so those things are deconstructed you can't deconstruct yourself because you don't know what you don't know you know so you allow God to show you his truth, the love, the light, the relationship, the grace, the mercy, all those things. That experience will change the areas in our lives that don't line up with that experience. See, deconstruction is a consequence. God is not trying to deconstruct you. God is trying to give you the truth. The truth will change the lies and if people go and try and change the lies they'll just be focusing on the lies and you know you can you can change your belief system but your belief system is just based on facts that you have decided are true that's very different from knowing the truth <laughs> you know i've changed lots of things i've believed because i was convinced that something else was better or that something else was actually the truth but until i experienced the truth it was still just a intellectual understanding of something because the truth is a person jesus who is the way the truth and the life you know, i'm never going to get truth from just trying to explore and come up with a different belief system you know, so allow God to show you what he's like, and that will change any areas in our lives which don't really show who he's really like. You know, and, you know, I know people, and I was the same, try to change my thinking by memorizing Bible verses or quoting Bible verses or confessing Bible verses. And I used to do that. And there was some element in that that the holy spirit um was able to work in that process to try and help me but basically me confessing a scripture is not going to make me experience that scripture it may give me a different perspective to that scripture and i might know that scripture and therefore be able to quote that scripture or use that scripture in different ways but until I've experienced the truth behind it, I don't have a testimony of the reality of that in my life. And that's the key. You know, I think deconstruction is a word that's used quite a lot at the moment because people are going through a process in which deconstruction is taking place. But that isn't God trying to deconstruct their minds. That's the result of him giving them a revelation of the truth and experience of the truth so that those things fall away it's not like he's going around trying to smash down what you believe he's trying to give you something which is truth and that will then allow those false beliefs will just to fall away
you know, which is so much better. When you have a testimony, it's so much better than a belief. Okay. Anyone else? I, I've just been in this process. I, um, I, I had mentioned to one of the groups that I had met someone 10 months ago and it, that relationship has just opened up um, meeting people that I would have never been a part of. <laughs> and it has been so much fun because you look at, you look at, I've had conversations with, um, I, I guess that what it is, my whole environment and everything has changed to such a degree. It's forced me to look at myself and the way I look at other people and the judgment part of me that would love to judge everyone. And this isn't the way I look or all my friends have ever looked. <laughs> <laughs> it's been just delightful and like yesterday I was out on Lake Erie fishing for walleye I've never touched a fish <laughs> unless it's dead <laughs> and, and it's you know it's just been like experiences opening up and I'm finding I'm finding something more within me than something from the outside and I know that it's it's God and his love coming through me. And it's not by what I'm saying, but it's by relationship and association and, um, and going, not limiting him in any way in who I associate with or anything like that. So I'm just finding I'm, I've stepped out of that little neat church world that I'd been in for so long. <laughs> That really isn't so neat. <laughs> so I, I'm just uh, I'm just having such a good time, and uh, it's it's hard to put it into words. So that's why I appreciate your words, <laughs> just because it, it fits my experience a lot. So I just hit, turn that out to you. <laughs> oh, absolutely, yeah, and and I think we are, can be really constrained within a sort of system and people who all think the same that doesn't give us any opportunity of sort of developing beyond and enjoying life because actually christians tend to do the same sort of stuff you know and they're sort of oh well you know we're gonna have, we're gonna have a we're gonna have a potluck meal and we're gonna eat quiche and you know all that sort of stuff you know yeah it sort of tends to be a bit staid and a little bit sort of boring uh, and that's not you know not to say that christians can't have fun and don't but generally speaking you know the world is a is a place for us to discover and enjoy and help to bring light into it in a way which is fun you know i think sometimes it's like why would people want to be christians when they look at christians and see how miserable they are after time and it's like well you have to go to church three times on a sunday why you know, it's like, oh, I'm, I'm enjoying myself today. and We're going out and you're doing this. Why? Oh, well, I want to worship God. Well, can't you worship God in, in, the, out in the fresh air? You know, I mean, there's sort of all these mindsets which people sort of look at the way we do things. And then when we try and get them to be contritions, we then want them to change what they were enjoying and come and join us in this Christian club. And, you know, and what happens is they lose touch with real life and all of the positive things that they have in their experience with God, they lose and they then become this church person, you know. And, you know, in reality, people are not really that interested. Um, and I think showing that we can enjoy life, have fun, love people, care for them, because that's what we would bring into that dynamic. For we would be representatives of God's love, showing that God is caring and compassionate by our love and compassion and helping them. You know, and then when people have got an issue in their life that all of a sudden they've hit a wall or something happens, where will they go? To those that they feel will be able to relate to them, help them, understand them, 
and experience that you know and that will help them find god in that you know so yeah absolutely keep on enjoying life i mean you know since i you know i enjoy life so much better now you know and it and it is so much more just how i think it was intended to be you know rather than me fix all these rules and things i have to do and don't have to do and i've got to go in here there and everywhere you know and you know i mean i go to some church meetings because i go with debbie and she likes she likes the fellowship with people and i go and we sing some songs and you know and i like singing so i i don't have a problem with it but i can you know i wouldn't go on my own if she wasn't there you know i go in because i enjoy being with her and i go because hey you know and i and i you know friend, having friends and having people that you can connect to is good i'm not saying it isn't but there's it's a struggle you know and and sometimes i go you know to home group and things like that and i have to bite my tongue you know like because i just don't want to i don't want to be offensive and offend them <laughs> And then sometimes I'll say some things which are sort of quite provocative, you know, because I think because God gives me permission to to help maybe just to open up this discussion in a certain way. But again, you know, if Debbie didn't go, I wouldn't go. It's like this week there's football on. So I'm going to watch the football, you know, um, and it's like because to me, I'm going to find that probably more enjoyable than actually sort of struggling with people's sort of theology and stuff which is i find it difficult to relate to you know and i don't want to be there to you know cause trouble you know i'm I'm not that's not the reason for being there so in a sense you know i feel free to go not go whenever you know rather than oh i have to go you know it's like you know when i was you know, leading in church it's like well there was no option you had to go you know you, you could not go i mean it would be like unless you're on holiday or something because that was expected it was expected that you would be there and of course i was speaking most of the time so i had no much choice to being there you know so um now i look back and i realized how much of that was because i was conditioned and would have felt guilty if i didn't and also because i was one of the leaders and was being remunerated i would have thought well it's more i am being paid to be here you know so it's a sense where it was a job now it was more than that for me i am but there was still a sense where i had to give them their money's worth you know what i mean it was that mindset that you you get conditioned into which is not freedom you know and eventually when when God spoke to me and he said, I'm really bored with this church stuff, you know, and I'm like, you can't say that. <laughs> yeah. And he's like, I'm like, that's, that's that. No, that can't be you. You know, it's like, how can you be bored with church people worshiping you? And he wasn't saying he was bored of people or bored of people trying to worship him, but just the, the format that we were doing the same things every week, you know, and it was like, and then I sort of pressed him on the thing. Well, what do you mean? You're bored. So then he then he said, well, you know, why don't you ask me what you'd like you to me for you to do? Well, we do. We ask you every week what we what you would like us to do. And he said, yeah, but you're only giving me a menu of five things to choose from. You know. Yeah, you know, and actually what you're really asking me is what order do you want to do those five things? You know, and I'm like, oh yeah, I suppose we are. I mean, like, well, we're led by the spirit. It's like, are we? Or are we only led within five things of what the spirit wants to do? You know, and actually we were. And then eventually, you know, when I got over the shock of that question, and I didn't say anything to anyone straight away because I thought, oh, God, that's going to cause a, a big up shot of stuff. All right, so I thought, OK. So then I started teaching the Engaging God program in my office on a Sunday morning because it was starting to get too advanced for the newer people that we had in church. And particularly for the people who were part of the 
re rehabilitation unit that we were running and stuff. So other people started to do the basics over again with people, which is fine. And I was able to carry on teaching. So then the first part of the service, I was actually down in my office and then I would come up and come and join them. And I then started to feel the same way. I felt, yeah, this is really boring, isn't it, really? You know, because I enjoyed myself more what I was doing down the office than when I came up and joined everybody else. And it was nothing, and not the people, because I love the people, but we got, and we were on the cutting edge of, you know, engaging God with the angels and going through portals into heaven and all that stuff. And yet we were still doing it in the same way. Someone was saying some things. We had times somewhere we were singing to God and we would have ministry or what, something else. But it was just this, oh, we might do this bit first or that bit first. You know, and actually, I actually understood what God was really trying to say to me. And I felt the same. And I felt, yeah, this is not, this is just not it, is it? You know, and therefore... You know, when then God sort of took me out of that scenario. And some of it was leading up to, well, what is church and why do why are we running a meeting? Because church is the relationship between people, each other and God, a group of people who have who are in a sense together in relationship. But what we did in having worship and a preach and this, that and the other it's like that was what God started to challenge. Why are you doing this? Well, because you want us to. Well, who said I wanted you to? You know, and it challenged people. And of course, then it was like, OK, well, what is this going to look like? So then we didn't do any of that. So we turned up on a Sunday. It was like, oh, what does God want to do then? What do you want to do, God? Well, if you'd asked me before you got here, I would have told you I didn't want you to come and do this today. Ah, ah, so it's not about meeting this way then and turning up in a building then. No, not every Sunday, no. So if you'd asked me, I would have told you that I wanted you to go and do something yesterday and go for a walk and enjoy the beautiful fresh air. Ah, okay, so this is a real different challenge to our thinking. This isn't just, oh, well, we're going to turn up in the building and then ask you what to do. This is actually, do you even want us to meet this way this week like this? So people struggled with that because they were so conditioned to being told that they had to turn up on the day to do whatever it is that was going to happen. That was church. And they were expected to be there if they were part of church. So it was very challenging. And we got to the point where those that were meeting, we got to, the point, so we, we started meeting together to say, well, let's just seek God and ask God to show us the way forward. So what is it? What is the way forward? And this was November, December, 2019. So then God used COVID to show us the way forward because suddenly we couldn't meet anymore anyway. And we had all the technology to meet online. But we asked God, do you want us to meet online? And it was like, no. Because all you'll be doing is recreating something online that you can't do in person. So it was like, oh. And eventually people were weaned off church. The meetings of church. The format and the structure that we call church. Now, they're still relating to one another. They still have relationships with each other. They still have the mission that God had given to care for people and to look after people and do all that. Now, some people just couldn't cope with not having a church service. So they went off and found a church service that would make them feel comfortable. Great. If that's what they want to do, no problem. They were free to do that. But some people were so free that they didn't have to go to a meeting on a Sunday or two meetings on a Sunday or whatever it might have been. They would never want to go back to that. I'm going to go to go to church every Sunday. They discovered that being church is very different than having to go to a meeting 
that we call church. So that deconstruction took place in people's understanding of church over a quite a long period of time. It wasn't like, and I didn't turn around and say, you can't do this anymore. I didn't turn around and say, you can't meet this way anymore. You know, because what would that be? That would be me forcing them into something. So I just said, OK, I'm not making these decisions. So actually, I'm not going to be a leader anymore. Who tells you what God might be saying or not saying? You're all responsible to hear God for yourself. So you decide what you're going to do. And then when sort of the whole COVID thing came along, you know, all of these restrictions came in and therefore we couldn't meet the way we were meeting anyway. And you couldn't actually even meet for a while with anyone individually, you know. So people actually realized that their relationship with God was just as strong, if not stronger, after they stopped doing Sunday church meetings than it was before. So they found that their relationship with God was an everyday relationship with God. A, a relationship with God, which was not based on the structure that we had put in place to help them. Now, some people probably did struggle and some people wanted the fellowship of meeting together in a bigger setting or whatever. And they found that in another place or whatever. But others just found that their relationship with God was you know, growing anyway, and that their relationship with other people, if it's genuine, is not going to be based on whether you met on a Sunday or not. So they still have a relationship and they still have friends, you know. So it's very interesting when you see the process that God takes us on to challenge our preconceived ideas about what the Christian life is, what is church, should we do this and do that? And when we're free from it, we find freedom. Now I'm free to go. I'm free not to go. I'm free to do whatever I feel in God. And, you know, and I know God enjoys me watching the football as much as he enjoyed if I went to our own group. Just, just yesterday, I, I kind of facilitate a, a meeting that we have on Sunday mornings. And I felt the freedom to say, just turn it over to someone else without feeling guilty and saying, I'm going on an adventure. <laughs> and I know it all went fine. I still love everyone, but I'm not, I'm just finding my constraint to have to be there. Mm. It, it's not dependent on me. And uh, I, I'm just finding a, another place. So it, it's, it's just an interesting process for sure. Oh, it absolutely is. Yeah. And and I'm not saying people shouldn't meet. And some people, God might want them to meet. And he might want them to sing and do stuff. And, and so every group of people needs to find out what God wants them to do or not do in their situation. I'm not saying this is prescriptive. I'm just saying God deconstructed our understanding of church because he was trying to get over. This isn't really church that we think it is by making it about the meeting we attend. Um, and that was the process that we went through and it freed people to discover that if they didn't get a message from a preaching on a Sunday, that God could still speak to them because we had taught them to hear the voice of God themselves. We had removed the necessity for them to hear a preacher telling them what God was saying because we taught them you can all engage God, you can all go into heaven, you can all experience God that God loves you. Now that freed them and freed them. You know, there are some people who like fellowship and like friendship and they like to engage with people and they find that good. That's great. So long as they don't think that that is the only way there is, or they start to judge other people for not doing it that way. And that's the key. Let people find with God where they are and there therefore they can enjoy the process and the and the journey they're on you know and it is a journey of discovery and adventure and which is not supposed to be rigid and fixed and only one way of doing it yeah no i don't want to ask anything i was just going to comment on this 
uh, conversation you've just had, and I have laughed so much. <laughs> I have because I I identified with all that you said going on in my life, and I thought to myself, I must be going on crazy because since the day they said, um, I still remember when um, COVID was declared and lockdown, and it was on a Sunday, we were at church, mm -hmm. and lockdown started on a Monday, and I said, this is it. And and I was rejoicing, and then people at church were like, "Why are you rejoicing?" I said, "This is the end of of the beginning of something new." They didn't understand it, and um, because I was doing all, I was sp I had spread myself thinly across church, and I was getting to the end of myself. And then when COVID came. That was it. I gave up everything and stopped everything. And now I am so free. I am feeling so relieved. Um, two weeks ago, I went away uh, for the weekend to people that I have never met, never knew. Somebody invited me and I had been asked to do something. And I said, I'm not coming. I'm going away to to strangers and I had the best time of my life and I was just identified with what Brenda said and what you then said is what we do and it's so true because now when I go to church that's exactly how I feel boredom the worst boredom ever and when I try to explain to people what is this what are we doing here they they seem to think I have gone to, I don't know, they don't understand what's going on. And I so identified with everything you said. It's so true. And that's how, if you really put yourself in that place of God is doing something new, what is this new thing? You will find it and you will understand it. And I really identify with that. And I hope that when people listen to this, they will they will get it and know that the old is past, really, but we still hang on to it. If we are doing it, we are doing it for ourselves. We are not seeking and finding out what he wants, really. It mm. is very funny that he said to you, he's bored. Mm. <laughs> I cannot help myself. Yeah. I, could, I couldn't stop laughing. <laughs> Well, if we yeah. are bored, I'm sure he is. Yeah, well, um, he said that to shock me into looking at the situation and thinking about it and thinking, oh, we've assumed so much because we just never thought to think differently or even to ask the questions, really. Even to stop. Yeah. And ultimately, when you look at, well, why am I doing this? What's the motive behind it? And I'm not saying people shouldn't meet. I'm not saying people shouldn't go and worship God. If they want to do it that way, fine. That's great. If they want to go and praise, they want to go and sing or listen to a sermon, that's fine. But ask themselves and ask each other, what is it that's behind that? Why am I doing it? And a, a lady that I know in, in one of these groups, God said to her and her husband, I don't want you to go to the meeting on a sunday anymore and her husband was like oh great you know we'll be able to do this <laughs> this and this she was like horrified and it took <laughs> months of every time the meeting time came she felt guilty for not being there it took her six months to get over that guilt well where does guilt come from not god so it was her conditioning and their own mindsets of what she thought that she should do or had to do. That when she wasn't doing it, she felt guilty for not being there. And eventually she realized and dealt with all of those emotional things, which were part of her conditioning. And then she totally enjoyed the freedom of not going. Oh, yeah. She then found that she started to relate to people much differently than she did before and there were friends who were real friends who they and but there are people who were church friends 
are only going to be your friend if you go to the same church as they yes, do. Yes, yes. They're not real friends. Yes. They're just people that are acquaintances that you know at church. What, who are real friends? Well, they will be with you through thick and thin. They will be there when you're doing all sorts of other things. And I think asking ourselves the question, why do I feel I need to do this? Whatever it might be in our lives, if we feel compelled or in some way that there would we would feel bad if we didn't do that, ask why. Is there something that's motivating me or controlling me or I would feel guilty if I didn't do this or didn't do that? And ask God to show us what it is, because he doesn't want us to be bound in bondage to something for some reason, thinking that he wants us to do it and he doesn't. And I think it's always a good question to ask, why, why am I doing this? You know, I've had to do that a lot in my life. And, and God has often had to give me a, a nudge to get me out of a situation. Like a few years ago, I think it was 2022, God spoke to me and said, I don't want you to do this yearly teaching series. You know, we, I did Vision Destiny teaching series every year, which was sharing my journals of what God has said during the year. And then God said, I don't want you to do it anymore. People need to have their own destiny with me that they have their own conversations with me that they can journal or put down. So I thought, oh, OK. So I stopped doing, stopped actually doing the desk, the stuff um, to teach it. And then God sort of nudged me and said, well, why are you still journaling? If I don't want you to share the journals, why are you still journaling? I thought, well, I like journaling. So I thought, well, I'm, and he said, well, that's OK. If you like journaling, that's fine. You know, but he was trying to get me to think, do you think you I want you to journal? And so then I thought, oh, well, how much of me thinking is this me thinking that God wants me to do this? And I like it because I think I'm pleasing God in some way. So I thought, OK, so you're saying to me, you, you don't want me to journal anymore? He says, well, that's your decision. <laughs> so I think. So are you telling me that you don't want to journal? I was trying, and I was trying to get him to give me an answer, but I fe I felt that the implication was you don't have to journal if you don't want to. It's not something I require of you. Our relationship isn't based on you journaling what what I talk to you about or what we have in conversation or experiences. So I thought, okay, all right, well I'll I'll stop writing down the the stuff, and then after a while. God said to me, if you're not journaling, why are you still meeting me this way? Because I was still getting up and meeting God in the morning and having my time with him and the conversations. And that, and that was a struggle to not do that because it was like, but, but I really like spending this time with you. But what God was trying to show me is that I could have a relationship with him all the time that was just as powerful, as strong, that I could receive that communication, that I would know his heart and I would be able to, rather than having, oh, well, here's the things God said to me and here's the things that God is telling me. He didn't stop talking to me. He didn't stop communicating to me, but he communicated to me much more on a infusion of that knowledge rather than a conversation about it so then it was like okay so has my relationship with god been better or worse since i stopped journaling and stopped having the time and conversations like that well it's different it's not better or worse it's just different and that the union i have with god in oneness and feeling his presence and joy, whether I'm in the garden or whether I'm in the workshop or whether I'm, you know, whatever I'm doing, that doesn't have to be confined to an hour every morning. God is, I have just as much new revelation and knowledge in coming to me without the way it came to me before because God is communicating all the time and I'm able to receive that communication and able to hear God's thoughts 
at times, but also just know his thoughts and know things that didn't come through a conversation, which was me listening, but he still shared his heart with me. Yeah. In a way which was very different. So things develop and grow. And if you like a time with God in which you think, well, this is quality talk, great. God doesn't mind that. He, he likes the time we have with him. But we can have a relationship of intimacy and in a union and oneness that isn't around religious disciplines and can be just as real in everyday life as it is in there. And I get up in the morning sometimes and have a conversation with God. Sometimes I have a conversation before I get up in the morning because I wake up thinking, oh, today's a good day. And some thoughts are in my mind and I start thinking and talking and communicating around those thoughts. And other times I'll get up and that won't happen, but I will feel and sense God's presence in all of my day and the joy of it. So life is so much more enjoyable. Now I'm free and not constrained to certain yes. discipline that I thought I had needed to have to maintain my relationship with God. And my relationship with God is now better. I mean, since I stopped doing that, the whole unconditional love concept and experience and all of that came out of not me sitting down with God and having a conversation about unconditional love, but feeling and sensing his unconditional love all the time. And that there wasn't a condition that I had to have a quiet time with God or have a time where I listened to him and sat down with him to enjoy my relationship with him. Now, if I did that, I, I in, would enjoy being with God in that way. And sometimes I do. But generally, I'm much more intimate with God and have a much more deeper appreciation and love for him because I realize how unconditionally loved I am without those conditions attached, whatever they are, whatever the religious conditions I thought that I had, because they were never a condition for him. They were a condition in my mind that I had thought that I needed to do this. And when God sort of got over to the fact, well, no, you don't. I became so much more freer and then felt so much more connected and joyful about everyday life because he was sort of expanding and removing the conditions that I'd put on myself. If you enjoy these videos, would you please take a moment to like, comment and subscribe? It really does help. Thank you very much.